Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I think the last time I was here was about 10 years ago. I, I actually interviewed at uh, Yale Medical School, but it was you know, rejected. <laughs> um, so I always have this uh, mixed feelings when I walk in through the entrance on Cedar and, you know, and so on, all these kind of you know, scary interviews and so on. But I have a lot of friends here and obviously admire uh, the community to no end. So it's just great to be back. And I'll tell you a couple of stories. Uh, from a number of folks in the lab that are actually achieving escape velocity. So if you're interested uh, in that next generation, I think these are folks that you might want to pay attention to. They've done really uh, great stuff. And, and I, I'm pitching this uh, towards really trying to uh, understand uh, fundamental mechanisms that could illuminate clinical hypotheses. So that's the basic theme of the, of the talk here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about precision oncology and some conceptual frameworks that allow us to really understand uh, targets, the context in which targets are important that might inform how we might utilize drugs against those targets in the clinical setting. So these two concepts have dominated our thinking in precision oncology, the concept of tumor maintenance genes or, or oncogene addiction, uh, the, the idea that a genetic element that incites cancer still remains relevant and rate limiting against the backdrop of many other alterations, and that targeting those rate limiting genetic elements would lead to a therapeutic result. And then there is synthetic lethality, which is an attempt to try to target uh, other dependencies, particularly those that derive from tumor suppressor gene deficiencies, so that one could target essentially what isn't there. Um, and so uh, this is the... Um, the concept where you have two pathways or genetic elements that converge on a biological process, that the extinction of either one is a viable situation, but the extinction of both leads to a cell lethal situation. And of course, the poster child for this uh, is BRCA and PARP, where these two uh, pathways converge on DNA homeostasis. And in a BRCA deficient cancer, the extinction of PARP leads to uh, essentially uh, catastrophic collapse of replication and rampant genomic instability that is inviable uh, from a cellular standpoint. So we've thought, you know, there are other ideas or approaches that could target uh, these kinds of genetic elements or even dominantly acting oncogenes uh, for which uh, there's no real therapeutic strategy. And the, overwhelming majority of cancers that we treat don't have those critical dependencies uh, that BRAF and melanoma, for example, or PARP in the case of BRCA, that we can target definitively and it leads to real impressive and durable therapeutic responses. Um, and so we wanted to think and expand our thinking about what would be the target space, how could we target these uh, signature alterations that occur, occur in the cancer context, particularly tumor suppressor genes. So we focused on the genomic architecture of these loci that, uh, where tumor suppressor genes reside. As you can see here, when you delete a tumor suppressor gene, in the case of P10, you not only surgically delete P10, but you also delete other neighboring genes in most cases. And these genes, if you look at them, they're genes that are not relevant to cancer. They're not cancer, professional cancer genes. They're genes that are involved in housekeeping functions. Many of them are involved in metabolism or, or various other um, uh, cell uh, uh, architecture, uh, et cetera, motors, and so on, uh, that are quite important, uh, but not, not mission critical that a cell could delete these. And the reason is, is that most of these really important uh, housekeeping genes are parts of multi-membered families. And so the cells can survive because of the redundancy from those other family members. So we thought that you know, there may be an opportunity to exploit the fact that you're deleting these other genes and that might confer cancer-specific vulnerabilities. So this concept we've dubbed collateral lethality is one in which you essentially have the deletion in a cancer, in a, in, in a cancer cell and you still survive because you have a redundant uh, gene function elsewhere in the genome. Normal cells obviously have both. Uh, but now the pharmacologic or genetic extinction of that second element would lead to a cell lethal situation, whereas normal cells would still have 
uh, that original gene and the extinction of the second member uh, would be tolerable. So this is the basic concept that uh, Florian uh, sought to experimentally validate. And we did this in a very systematic way. Uh, we first looked for genes across tens of thousands of genomes that have now been cataloged for genes that are deleted in cancer. We looked for genes that were part of functional homologs. So if you look at over a large phylogenetic distance, you can rapidly discern what by in simple systems would be single genetic elements that then expand to multi-membered family members. And then uh, very importantly, we exploited the experimental merits of lower systems such as yeast to look at their knockout data and identify genes that are cell essential uh, for viability. And so we put all of that together and came up with uh, dozens of genes that fit these criteria. And the first one, the first example, was a gene that resided in the 1P36 tumor suppressor loci, which has multiple tumor suppressors. Uh, it's heterozygously deleted in many cancers, but homozygously deleted in about 2 to 3 percent of GBMs, liver, and so on. And uh, neighboring uh, these multi-tumor suppressors is enolase 1, uh, which is a critical enzyme that is responsible for the penultimate step in glycolysis, very important for energy production. And if you knock it out in yeast and there's only one enolase, it is cell lethal. And so, um, however, in the case of mammalian systems, there are multiple uh, uh, orthologs. You have eno1, which is the dominant activity in cells, enolase 2, and then eno3 is uh, muscle specific. So you have eno1 and 2 as the major ones. Um, and so we, we sought to determine whether or not there's a collateral lethal situation that we could generate in the context of this example. And so again, it's very simple. We deleted ENO1. What happens if we extinguish ENO2, either genetically or pharmacologically? Normal cells still have ENO1 intact. And what we found was that we knocked out ENO2. We generated a profound cell lethal situation, proliferation, apoptosis. And we could rescue that by putting in a hairpin resistant ENO1 cDNA. So this at least was some genetic proof of concept for this. We then developed uh, pharmacologic inhibitors that were preferentially effective against ENO2. I won't go through all the medicinal chemistry. Um, there was a, an enzyme known as FA, which is a transition state analog inhibitor for uh, enolase, um, magnesium dependent, uh, and, uh, but its PK was lousy. So we put on these uh, POM uh, to help stabilize the protein and also enhance cell permeability because uh, it's a very charged molecule. And uh, we've used this molecule, POM-HEX, uh, in a setting where we inject glioma stem cells into mice that are either ENO1 intact or null. Uh, and so these cells rapidly develop uh, in infiltrated tumors, uh, and most of the animals succumb within about two months following injection. And what you see here is that even with just transient treatment of POM-HEX, about 50% of the animals had durable cure of the disease. So this is at least a pharmacologic proof of concept that if you extinguish enolase activity against the backdrop of enolase 1 nullizygosity, uh, that you can then uh, provide um, a pharmacologic opportunity for the treatment of, of these diseases. Now, unfortunately, it's only about 1 or 2% of GBMs. So we expanded our, our view of, of uh, potential collateral lethality targets, uh, and we focused on uh, this a target that was in the SMAD4 locus. SMAD4 is homozygously deleted in many cancers. In fact, it's quite impressive in, in the scope of deletion. And right next door to uh, SMAD4 was a gene that caught our attention, which was malic enzyme 2, which is a mitochondrial malic enzyme. And this gene is co-deleted along with SMAD4. In fact, about 100,000 new cancer cases uh, in the United States alone are malic enzyme 2 null. And so you can see the first bar is uh, malic enzyme. The second is SMAD. And essentially what you have is, um, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. But uh, you have um, about a third of pancreas cancers that have uh, co-deleted uh, ME2 and SMAD4 and many other cancers that have additional levels of deletion.
So what is uh, malic enzyme? So it's a really core enzyme that is quite important and a number of, has a number of known properties. First of all, there are two compartments where malic enzyme is operative and they don't cross uh, functionalize. So you have malic enzyme 1, which is a cytoplasmic malic enzyme. It is cell essential. If you knock it out, cells die. You have mitochondrial malic enzymes 2 and 3. And they serve to generate reducing power in the mitochondria, but they also generate pyruvate, which feeds the TCA cycle. Those are the known canonical functions of uh, the mitochondrial malic enzymes. So uh, as I just mentioned, we have a lot of malic enzyme 2 null. And the question is, what would happen if we were to um, genetically or pharmacologically inhibit malic enzyme 3? So we generated inducible hairpins. So this is the knockdown of malic enzyme 3. Doesn't touch malic enzyme 1. And, and this is just one example, but we have many. So this is a human uh, pancreas cancer cell line that's ME2 null. Um, and if you knock out ME3, you deplete ME3, uh, the cells are no longer able to form tumors. And these are all the different controls of irrelevant hairpin or cDNA rescue, et cetera. So it's clearly important. So if you knock out mitochondrial malic enzyme deficiency, it's a, a cell lethal situation for cancer cells. So now we wanted to understand, well, what is malic enzyme actually doing uh, to lead to this cell lethal situation? So we did, as we typically do in the lab, transcriptomic, metabolomic, proteomic analyses in vitro and on the organismal level to try to understand in an unbiased way what's going on with, um, with, with any particular genetic element. And so as was expected in the case of the mitochondrial malic enzyme deficiency, we have a profound decrease in the production of NADPH, which was expected, and a commensurate significant increase in intracellular ROS. And the mitochondria really become fried and undergo caspase 3 mediated apoptosis as a result. And then we did unbiased metabolomic analysis. Um, and for the aficionados, glutamine is really important in pancreas cancer maintenance, the work of Alec Kimmelman at NYU. Uh, and we found that in our uh, unbiased analysis of malic enzyme depletion, metabolomics, that there was no change in the utilization of glutamine. However, the major thing that we found was a profound decrease in the utilization of branched-chain amino acids. Branched-chain amino acids are essential amino acids, and they're critically important for generating glutamic acid, uh, which is vital for the production of nucleic acids, amongst other uh, substrates. So this, this uh, caught our attention, uh, and we pursued this still further. On the transcriptomic level, we began to analyze what might be perturbed in this pathway that's well established that utilizes branched chain amino acids. And in that transcriptomic data, we found that branched chain amino acid 2 was significantly repressed in its expression. So BCAT2 uh, is a transaminase. It's very highly expressed in pancreas and in pancreas cancer. Uh, and it essentially catalyzed the transfer of the amino group uh, of BCCAs from uh, alpha clitoglutarate, so you can generate uh, glutamic acid. So this was decreased in its expression, and we inferred from that 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 might be responsible for the decreased utilization of branched chain amino acids. So uh, we then uh, generated um, the uh, knockdowns of ME3 and a ME2 null cell, and indeed we see that BCAT2 gene expression is significantly decreased when you knock down the mitochondrial malic enzyme activity. So now we wanted to understand what was the connection between malic enzyme activity and this profound decrease in branched chain amino acids. And so uh, since the transcriptomic data told us that gene expression was decreased, the first thing we did was look at the promoter of BCAT2. And uh, one cis element was of significant interest, and that was one that was a consensus binding site for SREBP1. Uh, this is a, a very important molecule that is a transcriptional coactivator, regulates many genes. Uh, and here's the consensus binding element. 
And indeed, when we knock down mitochondrial malic enzyme and chip uh, the um, uh, co uh, transcriptional coactivator, we see a very significant decrease uh, from the baseline uh, interaction. So this shows that it directly interacts with the cis element um, and that the knockdown profoundly decreases the ability of SRBP1 to bind to the cis element. So something was inhibiting the activity of SRBP1. And the reason why SRBP1 is of interest to us is that it's, it's regulated, its activity is regulated at the level of phosphorylation, and it's phosphorylated by AMPK. So it turns out that when you have really high ROS levels, AMPK becomes activated. AMPK then phosphorylates many substrates. One of the substrates is SRBP1. Oops. Um, and uh, you see uh, that this site is phosphorylated in the context of malic enzyme, mitochondria of malic enzyme depletion. AMPK becomes significantly activated um, and you have this phosphorylation event which inactivates uh, the uh, coactivation activity of SRBP1. So high ROS activates AMPK which phosphorylates and inactivates SRBP1. You get decreased uh, BCAT2 expression, decreased branch train amino acids utilization. So what are the consequences of that? So first thing we wanted to do was to assess the importance of BCAT2 and SRBP1 in the anti-tumorigenic phenotype that we had seen. So we did, uh, first of all, a knockdown or loss of function studies and found that when you knock down BCAT2 or knock down SRBP1 in pancreas cancer cell lines that are Me2 intact, uh, what you see is a very significant decrease in proliferation, increase in apoptosis, and a decrease in colony uh, formation. Now the real, that's not too surprising. SRBP1 does a thousand things. BCAT2 also has many functions. So this was not a very compelling result, but the real result, the real epistasis experiment is to knock down malic enzyme and overexpress BCAT2 and see if you can rescue tumor genesis in vivo. And that's what we found. So uh, what PJ found was that when you enforced expression of BCAT2, which all of our unbiased analyses converged on the regulation of BCAT2 and utilization of branch chain amino acids, that that alone was sufficient in the context of depletion of malic enzyme, mitochondrial malic enzyme, able to uh, restore the tumorigenic potential of these cell lines. So that was uh, encouraging that we had a pathway functionally and biochemically that was uh, now well understood and linked. So as I mentioned, one of the critical things that these branch chain amino acids do is to generate substrates that are actually extremely important uh, for the production of uh, DNA synthesis. Um, and this is uh, essentially this pathway here uh, in which you're generating these uh, fundamental elements, building blocks, for de novo nucleotide biosynthesis. So we wanted to assess whether or not this was a critical aspect of what mitochondrial malic enzyme was doing in the biology of, um, of pancreas cancer. Now, I'm not going to show you the data, but we did other experiments where we showed that if you utilize um, cell permeable pyruvate, you can partially rescue malic enzyme depletion. Uh, if you use very powerful antioxidants like Trolox, uh, and neutralize some of the ROS. Uh, you can mitigate some of the apoptosis, so there's a modest rescue there. Uh, but the one that really rescued was manipulation of this pathway. As I mentioned, if you overexpress BCAT2, that rescues. And then the last experiment that I'll show you uh, is uh, if you utilize free nucleotides, you can also rescue. And this was a pretty uh, impressive result where at least in, in, in vitro, in cell culture, uh, if you add free nucleotides, uh, that even if you're, mal if you're malic enzyme deficient, this is your colony numbers, you can have a pretty uh, respectable rescue of uh, colony formation just by adding free nucleotides to this mitochondrial malic enzyme deficient state. So uh, what we've learned is that collateral lethality, at least we have yet another example. We're working through about a half a dozen other examples. So I think that this is going to be 
a reasonable framework for identification of potentially new targets that are outside of the typical domain of your oncogene tumor suppressor gene axis that result from uh, by, bystander effects. Um, and that uh, on the mechanistic level, the two major reasons for uh, mitochondrial malic enzyme importance uh, relates to uh, de novo nucleotide biosynthesis and the maintenance of ROS homeostasis to a level that uh, enables a mitochondria to stay intact. Otherwise, you undergo caspase uh, mediated apoptosis. So that was collateral lethality. Let me just now introduce another concept, which really is derivative of synthetic lethality, but it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. So by now, we've sequenced tens of thousands of tumors, and we have a lot of information where you can begin to do statistical analyses. And we asked a really simple question. We asked, are there genes that are occasionally deleted but never deleted in the context of a tumor suppressor gene deficiency. Uh, that could be due to epistasis, uh, or it could be that perhaps that gene becomes important and an important effector when you knock out the tumor suppressor. Right? So we looked for examples of this. Um, and just to show you, uh, give you a known synthetic lethal interaction, BRCA and PARP, cancer cells never delete both, and that makes sense. So you have this mutual exclusivity with, the, with this relationship. But we wanted to look at it in a different way, which is to look for effectors of a tumor suppressor gene deficiency. So I'll give you one example today. Uh, and that is this really interesting protein, CHD1, which is a chromodomain protein. And what we found in prostate cancer is that when you delete P10 or you have other uh, uh, genetic alterations that target the PI3 kinase pathway, like AT, AKT amplification or PI3 kinase mutations that activate the pathway, CHD1 is not deleted. Uh, yet it's occasionally deleted, so some cells are perfectly happy with the deletion of CHD1. And CHD1 caught our attention because at that time it was known to be a chromodomain protein, and it was really cool because it also had something to do with stem cell biology. It was important for maintenance of ES cell pluripotency. So we wanted to look at this. So, uh, so the first thing we did is some really simple experiments. We took cells that were P10 deficient prostate cancer cells. And if you knock down CHD1, the cells do not grow and they undergo apoptosis. So it looks pretty interesting. Now this is a P10 intact prostate cancer cell. You knock down CHD1, nothing happens. But if you crisper out P10, suddenly they become sensitive to CHD1 knockdown. So that was encouraging. Uh, we had similar results in other lines, in other cancers, like breast cancer, et cetera. So uh, there have been a lot of these uh, synthetic lethal screens over the years, and I tend not to put too much weight on those kinds of studies. So the thing that we really wanted to, that would convince us, is to actually show why P10 deficiency made CHD1 important. What was the direct biochemical link between those two elements. And so we did, again, uh, integrated uh, transcriptomic proteomic analysis, et cetera. And what we found, bottom line, is that P10 regulates the stability of CHD1 protein. Uh, so if you overexpress P10, you have less CHD1. If you inhibit AKT, you have less CHD1. If you overexpress JSK3 beta, you have less uh, 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 CHD1. So somehow this axis regulates the stability of CHD1 protein. If you look at the, uh, the anatomy of the protein, what you see is that there are two degrons, and those two degrons are consensus binding elements for TRCP1 uh, binding elements, the E3 ubiquitin ligase. And also there's a phosphorylation site embedded right in the degron that was also very interesting. That was a consensus binding uh, consensus site for GSK3 beta phosphorylation. Um, and so if you over, if you chip CHD1 and TRCP, you can show that they are physically interacting, so it's able to bind to this. If we mutate this, you lose the interaction. Uh, if you overexpress uh, the E3 ubiquitin ligase, you end up with less CHD1 protein. And if you inhibit protein uh, degradation and you uh, you, you could see that you end up with a nice polyubiquitin 
ladder uh, when you IP either CHD1 or uh, the E3 ubiquitin ligase. So uh, we feel that we forged the direct link between P10 status through JSK3 beta, phosphorylation of a degron, interaction with E3 ubiquitin ligase to regulate the stability of CHD1. So when you are P10 deficient, you stabilize CHD1. So now the question is, what is CHD1 doing? Uh, and CHD1, obviously, is a chromatin uh, domain protein. Uh, it's a regulator. And the um, question is, what is it regulating? And what is it regulating in the context of P10 deficiency? Um, and so it's known to bind H3K4 trimethylation marks and turn on genes, thousands of genes. Uh, and, um, and so we, we wanted to do experiments where we would chip CHD1, and we'd also look at chromatin marks, uh, H3K4 trimethyl micro marks, as well as others, and, and bring all that data together uh, in the context of, of our model systems. And so when we do that, when we chip, and we also look at the transcriptomic data, the uh, chip and the uh, chromatin mark data, uh, we end up with still a very large number of genes. And then you put them into pathway analysis, the most important pathway that comes up is NF-kappa B. And that was really gratifying because there was this long-sought nebulous link between P10 and NF-kappa B activation, work of Michael, Karen, and others. Uh, and NF-kappa B had been known to be important for prostate cancer progression. So this was encouraging that we, this came out as the top pathway. And, uh, and then uh, what we did was to uh, look for what genes might be relevant and assess genetically whether or not they were, in fact, important for prostate cancer progression. So, uh, so what, we, what we then did uh, was to uh, generate the conditional knockout for CHD1 against uh, the backdrop of the probasin CRE, which deletes it in the prostate. And its knockout for CHD1 is completely dispensable. There's no phenotype in the mouse prostate when you knock this out alone. Now, if you take P10 knockout from work of Hong Wu and Pierre Paulo Pandolfi and others, you generate a very nice, robust, high-grade pin, adenocarcinoma, non-metastatic, but nevertheless, a pretty aggressive tumor that goes on to kill the animals. Uh, if you generate the double knockout, you block the progression of the, of the cancer. And, uh, and this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. So these are, these, this is the P10 knockout, and this is P10 plus CHD1 knockout. So this is at least genetic in vivo evidence that this is uh, a, um, at least a strategy that appears to be a viable one on the, uh, on the level of uh, a therapeutic target for P10 deficient uh, setting. And we're, we're working on developing uh, chemistry that could target uh, CHD1. But we wanted to take it to a different level. We really, um, and this is just another example, by the way, this is an even more virulent prostate cancer model. It's again uh, P10 deficient, but it's also got SMAD4 in it. And these animals all die within 30 weeks, and 100% of them have metastasis to lymph nodes, some of them to lung, and so on. Uh, and even in this case, uh, if you knock out CHD1, it ends up uh, rescuing um, the animals end up surviving much longer. So now that we um, had this model system and we have the genetic uh, uh, in vitro model systems and from human, it allowed us to compare the data across those different model systems to assess uh, what are the potential cancer biological processes that CHD1 might be regulating. And uh, at the top of the list, you know, were a lot of the things that were involved, some of the things that were kind of expected, you know, like RAS signaling, proliferation targets, et cetera, uh, EMT, those were all expected. Uh, what wasn't was uh, a lot of the ones that really fell into things that were clearly involved in immune regulation. You can't give a cancer talk these days without saying immunology. Um, and so uh, what we then looked what, was we looked at the tumors, uh, and I'm sure Marcus noticed this already, uh, but um, one of the things that we found when you had the single 
versus the double knockout. So this is P10. Here you have lots of MDSCs, myeloid derived suppressor cells, M2 macrophages, and very few T cells. When the double knockout, you see a very significant decrease in these myeloid uh, suppressor cells and a dramatic increase in effector T cells. And we have, you know, this is his, uh, histochemistry, we have CYTOP data, very similar data. And we looked in human, we looked for high CHD1 versus low, and we see very similar correlations with respect to suppressive myeloid cells that are in that compartment. So now we wanted to understand you know, whether or not there were critical downstream targets of CHD1 that we could potentially exploit therapeutically. Uh, and uh, here what we did, again, we took advantage of cross-species analysis and different strategies. So we looked at the CHD1 chip data in PC3 cell lines. We did a CHD1 knockdown in PC3, so that you know, each of them give us you know, 1,000 genes here, a couple of thousand genes here. And then we also now had in vivo data where we can compare the double versus the single knockout, and we did transcriptomic analysis there. And we triangulated, if you do a 1.5-fold cutoff, there's only 13 genes that survive, the filter. If you do two-fold, there are only four genes that survive. And one of them was IL-6, and we just show here that uh, IL-6 is dramatically decreased with CHD1, and also the chip data shows that uh, CHD1, in fact, binds to uh, the IL-6 promoter. So we were pretty interested in this because obviously there are agents that are actionable in the clinic, uh, and, uh, and this, uh, because IL-6 is really at this nexus of the biology that we're seeing, it's known to be very important for the recruitment and activation of myeloid-derived suppressor cells and for uh, polarizing uh, tumor-associated macrophages into the suppressive M2 uh, phenotype, uh, which then has a pretty significant impact on effector T cell function. And so this is, I think, at least one way of exploiting the experimental merits of mice, comparing it with human data, to zero in on potentially uh, genetic elements that are potentially targetable with a really clear clinical hypothesis. So you'd have P10 deficient breast or, or prostate cancer, and you'd use uh, anti-IL-6, for example, coupled with checkpoint blockade uh, to generate uh, responses. And uh, we have data along those lines, and just in the last few slides, I want to just review the data and the importance beyond T cells of this myeloid compartment. Uh, and this, this is uh, the work of Xin Lu and Gokong Wang in the lab. So we all know, you know the progress that we've made with targeted therapy and the excitement that immunotherapy is not only generating responses, but is also creating durable responses. And now the whole field is really focused on what, what can we do to combine these and combine different immunotherapeutic strategies to, as Jim Allison says, raise this tail so that we can really uh, help um, treat more patients and have those patients survive their disease. So um, the strategy that we did uh, was to first do this in prostate cancer, which is among the most immunologically cold tumors, and checkpoint blockade has failed. Uh, and uh, both the a single agent, the double agent, the double dual checkpoint blockade might have some activity, but in the case of IPI, it was only 6%. Nevo, there were no responses. Um, and so what we did was, with the help of Jim Horner, who's like the Yoda of mouse genome manipulation, um, what Jim did was to develop a blastocyst system uh, where we actually had all of these alleles in an ES cell that would do blastocyst injection and generate prostate cancer uh, prone mice like 80 to 90% of the mice are prostate cancer prone. We calculated that if we had 100 cages with all the different alleles, that it would take us five years to generate the mice needed for the trials that we wanted to do. So we did this, and, uh, and then that allowed us to basically do multi-arm trials. Now, uh, the approach that we used was to take advantage of drugs that were already out there that had actually been in prostate cancer trials. And I'll just give you three examples here. One is the satinib. Another one is Cabo, and the other one is BEZ. And these have all um, not done well in the clinic for different reasons. The satinib uh, trashes both T cells as well as myeloid cells. 
So we thought that would be an interesting thing to look at. Uh, this, these agents, however, target the myeloid compartment, but they leave intact T-cell signaling. So we thought that would be an interesting contrast. And so what we did in this experiment is we generated a few hundred mice. We enlisted them into imaging. As the tumors began to emerge, we did castration and enzalutamide treatment to generate castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and then followed the mice uh, with imaging and enlisted mice with equivalently sized tumors into clinical trials. And then we would just have different arms. We would monitor them. And then we did endpoint analysis of you know, histology and immunotyping and gene profiling. And this is the bottom line result. So what you can see here is immune checkpoint blockade. This is dual checkpoint blockade, as would be expected, had a meager impact on tumor. Uh, Cabo alone, BEZ alone, desatinib, also no impact. Interestingly, desatinib plus immune checkpoint blockade, no impact. But the two agents that differentially impact myeloid and preserve T-cell, together with immune checkpoint plate, had, had a significant impact. And we all now understand a lot more about the mechanism and the signaling, et cetera. So we wanted to be a little bit more sophisticated. We know the circuitry between the cancer cell and the uh, recruitment of the myeloid cells, et cetera. So for example, we know that CXCR2 is really important on the MDSCs, and it's important for recruitment and activation of MDSCs. When we combine uh, a CXCR2 inhibitor, uh, SX682, plus immune checkpoint blockade, we get a really significant decrease. In fact, this has some uh, pretty decent activity, even as a single agent. Um, and then these are other molecules uh, that are um, uh, delta or beta selective inhibitors that also have significant prog progress that, again, don't affect T cell function. Uh, and so they, these are strategies that I think we can utilize. These are drugs that have already been in the clinic. Uh, this plus the example I gave earlier of IL-6. These are very simple strategies uh, that have been illuminated by some of the science, the cross-species analysis, and so on, that, of course, needs to be tested in the clinic. Uh, but I think has, you know, significant merit. And in de indeed, these early stage clinical trials are getting underway. So the basic idea is that you really have to target different axes. You need uh, cell death in the cancer cell. That creates, you know, peptides and immunological cell death, assuming that that machinery for processing is intact. And that's another way that cancer cells subvert. They knock out proteasomal uh, components that lead to impaired processing. Uh, but assuming that that occurs uh, and you create this immunological cell death with targeted agents, you then unleash the power of the immune system, the T cells, by alleviating checkpoint blockade. Um, and then you have other agents that differentially impact MDSCs but spare T cells. I think this is going to end up being a more reasoned, hypothesis-driven strategy. And as we work in the clinic and do longitudinal profiling and begin to see the adaptive responses, the resistance mechanisms that are coming out from a lot of these therapies, that's going to provide another data set that allows, that will allow us to really refine our clinical hypotheses uh, to uh, do a much better job for cancers like prostate cancer. So what I uh, mentioned are two basic strategies, conceptual frameworks, collateral lethality, that takes advantage of bystander deletions that create cancer-specific vulnerabilities and synthetic essentiality uh, that arise as a result of tumor suppressor gene deficiencies uh, that then create uh, um, essential rate-limiting genetic elements that are important as effectors for the tumor suppressor gene deficiency. Um, I'd say this has been validated now several times. So I'm pretty confident about collateral lethality. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical in general, and I'd say that synthetic essentiality, at this point, we have one really killer result and, and example, but whether it's going to really be uh, something that's going to translate across many different genetic elements. You know, we've got several hundred candidates for RB and P53 and APC and SMAD4, so we're going to see if there are other themes that emerge um, that might be exploitable, but we're not there yet. Uh, but we'll, we'll do our best. So I think these are the concepts that are helping us with respect to precision medicine. It's the tumor maintenance concept. 
synthetic lethality. I think these have been have got clinical proof of concept, uh, synthetic essentiality, the example that D, um, and collateral lethality from fluorine and PJ. And then I think the other thing that's really beginning to emerge is really understanding the tumor as an organ system and trying to really understand the heterotypic interactions between tumor uh, and um, t cancer cell and the host that really allows uh, this system to be maintained. I think those are some really important opportunities. I think what we're all excited about immunotherapy, we have to recognize also that only a minority of patients respond at this point and the toxicities are really significant. So we've got to do a much better job. We're nowhere near where we need to be uh, to really make the kind of impact that our patients expect from us. So these are the folks that did the work. Florian, uh, collateral lethality. Uh, D uh, did the CHD1 work. PJ did the malic enzyme work. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, Zin and Gokong uh, did a lot of the uh, prostate cancer work that I showed at the very end. And Jim Horner, Alan Wong, Denise Spring, who helped me in the lab over the years, and our wonderful collaborators. Thank you very much.